Welcome to my raised bed vegetable garden. Now, I've grown vegetables for many years, almost strictly in raised beds. And at my last house, it was basically out of necessity because we didn't have any sun in any spot where we had open ground. I do have several videos on how to build this type of raised bed and this type of raised bed. Now, while both of those videos will tell you how to build raised beds, that's not what this video is about. This video is before you're setting up your raised beds, what to think about so you don't make mistakes that I have and that other people have, and you can get off to a great start this year without any mistakes. The first mistake is making your bed too long or too wide. My favorite width for a bed is four feet wide. My favorite length is eight feet long. A four by eight bed is great for almost everybody. It's not too wide, so from either side you can reach into the center, or if you've got long arms like me, you can reach almost all the way over. It's also not too long. If you build a 20 foot bed, every time you have to go around to the other side of that bed, you gotta walk all the way down, all the way back. Another great thing about a four by eight raised bed is that it saves money and waste. You can get eight foot pieces of lumber at pretty much any hardware store. So three eight foot pieces of lumber will build your bed. One of those pieces you'll cut in half or have someone at the hardware store cut it in half for you. Those are the two ends of the bed. And then the other two pieces are the sides. Now this isn't exactly beds, but it does have to do with the beds, and that is the space between them, the paths. Now mine are a little more than two feet wide. I just like to have them about the size of me turning sideways, kneeling in the path, so I don't have to get into some weird positions. So when you're planning these things out, literally sit down between the beds and see how much size you need. The second mistake is to make your bed too shallow. Now, that could be different for different people. You wanna build your bed tall enough based on your comfort level or what kind of substrate is under the raised bed. So if you have a hard time bending over, then you might wanna build your beds up, maybe two, three feet tall, maybe more. If you have good soil underneath the bed, or at least not bad soil, uh, a six inch tall bed is totally fine. If you have concrete like I used to have, then you're gonna need 12 to 14 inches depth in your raised bed. Most vegetables wanna send their roots down about a foot. And so if you have a six inch tall raised bed and then you have soil underneath that, that's fine. If you don't, you need to give them that foot above whatever that substrate is. Now here we have a gopher problem. And so when I first built my beds, I built them six inches tall and I put hardware cloth underneath to keep the gophers out totally does its job, lasts for years. I recommend it to anyone who has a gopher issue. The problem I've had with the six inch deep beds with the gopher wire underneath them is you can't plant you know, long carrots or parsnips or anything like that. They have to be short ones, which isn't that big of a deal. The other problem I had was trying to put in like uh, a teepee trellis for beans, let's say. You only got that far to pound them in and that's not really far enough. The wind took them over. So in the three beds that I built last year to expand the width of the garden, I actually doubled the height. And now it's 12 inches deep, just two, uh, two by sixes on top of each other. And what's great about these simple framed raised beds is you can expand them or build them taller whenever you want to. In fact, over the next couple of years, I think I'm gonna take all of my beds and put another two by six on top of them to make them all 12 inches deep. And it's really easy to do. You just stack the boards on top and put a two by four or a four by four or some piece of scrap wood in the corner to screw into and maybe one more on each side somewhere in the middle of the bed just to keep them from shifting, keep them from bowing out, just keep them together. The third mistake is to make your bed out of the wrong material. Now, there's not a lot of wrong material. In fact, you don't even need material. You can make your bed just piling up the soil about six to 12 inches tall and planting directly into it. You're still gonna get the benefits of drainage and all that good stuff, but you don't have to spend money on any kind of material to hold that in. Now, I prefer the material because I like a neat garden. And if you're like me and you want edges, I would say wood is the cheapest way to go. I use Douglas fir, you can use redwood, or cedar, those will be a little more expensive in the beginning, but they'll probably last a little bit longer. What you wanna stay away from is compressed or treated lumber uh, that may not be so good for your health. Now they're not as dangerous as they used to be when they were actually treated with arsenic. Now they're treated with something called copper azole. It is not organic approved. 
Whether it leaches into your plants or not, I don't know. I'd just rather be safe than sorry and just replace mine in six or seven years versus however long you'll get out of the treated stuff. To me, it's a good trade-off. These beds here are made out of fabric. The company that made these is Grassroots. I'll put a link below. The great thing about fabric beds is they root prune. And that means as the roots hit the edge of the bed, they detect the oxygen that's coming through that fabric and they actually split. It's like you're pruning them. When you prune or pinch out a plant, it causes more branching. Same thing down below, it causes more roots. So instead of wrapping themselves around, you know, you find a, a pot bound plant, they just split, 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 and you get a nice healthy root system. So I love these fabric beds. I actually grew a whole bunch of sweet potatoes in them last year. It was a huge harvest in just two four by four raised beds. I think I got like 86 pounds of sweet potatoes out of those two beds. And the last choice is metal raised beds. These are great as well. They come in lots of different designs. They come in a lot of different heights and they're gonna last a long time, more than any of the other choices. Of course, they're the most expensive option. All right, now it's time to fill the bed. So the mistake there would be filling it with the wrong growing medium. This is where most of the cost is gonna be in your raised bed. Therefore, it's probably what most people skimp on but it's really the most important thing. We're growing in raised beds to get all the benefits, one of which the main one is good drainage and good soil that's not compacted. You want a light, fluffy texture that you can just dig your hands down into. You'd never be able to do that in the ground. And so you never wanna use garden soil to fill your raised beds with. I know it's tempting, especially if you got a lot of extra soil laying around, but it doesn't work the same way. When you fill it with that, it's gonna compact. Even some of the best soil, maybe if you have the best loam in the world, it might work, but do you really wanna take that chance? So clay soil, of course not. That's never gonna work. Sandy soil, that would never work either. You would lose all the water. It would just drain right through. So you're gonna to wanna to use a potting soil or a raised bed mix. There's some great bulk options. If you have a mushroom farm near you, you know, look it up. A lot of times they give their mushroom compost away for free. You just gotta transport it and shovel it, but it's free. So like I said, the main cost of filling a raised bed is the soil. Now, if you've got a three foot tall raised bed, that's where it can get real expensive. But you only have to worry about the top 12 inches having that good potting soil, raised bed mix, compost, the rest of it can be filled with other types of organic material. Organic meaning they will eventually break down. So you can start on the bottom with some large uh, tree branches, limbs, go up with a layer of smaller branches, up with another layer of twigs, then leaves, get smaller as you go to the top. And over the years, all of that will break down and eventually you'll have good soil all the way throughout. Now just be prepared with this method. It will sink a bit every year, not a lot, and you'll have to top it up, which you have to do anyway. We'll get to that. But it does make filling a raised bed, a brand new raised bed, a lot cheaper. One thing I would warn you on is do not use grass clippings to fill your raised bed, unless you want a lovely sewage smell every time you water for at least two months. Ask me how I know. The fifth mistake, I just hinted at it, uh, is not refreshing the soil. You're gonna notice every year, no matter if you've got it filled with branches and, and twigs and leaves, or if it's all uh, compost or potting soil, every year you are gonna lose a little bit. And it could be from erosion, settling, you know, pulling out plants and the, the soil goes with the roots. So every year in spring or fall or both, I do both, I add another inch or two of good compost or potting soil or raised bed mix just to the top. I don't mix it in. It's going to do a few things. It's going to, first of all, keep that root run as deep as it needs to be. The second thing it's going to do is actually make a blanket over the soil that was there the previous year. And that's going to help bury some of maybe the spores for bacteria, diseases, things like that. It just puts a nice physical uh, blanket between that and your next crop. It also just reinvigorates the soil with new organic matter. So all those great beneficial bacteria and bugs and worms can start to pull that down, break it down and get it down into the soil. The sixth mistake is not mulching. Now, mulching 
keeps the weeds down. It keeps the moisture in the soil. For me, in a dry climate, it is invaluable. But not fighting weeds all summer, that's pretty good too. And I water with drip irrigation and my, my mulch goes over that. So none of that moisture ever sees the light of day. It does not evaporate from the sun. It goes straight into the soil and stays there. If you move mulch away, you can see that the soil underneath is wet. Whereas right next to it, same bed, no mulch, the soil is dry. It's gonna save you money on your water bill and if you water by hand, it's gonna save you a lot of time. Mulch is also yet another blanket between the soil and your plants and it's organic, so it's eventually gonna break down and be taken into the soil. Now make sure when you plant and you have mulch, you move the mulch aside, plant in the soil and put the mulch back. You never want to uh, bury mulch in the soil because that will start to rob nitrogen from the soil as it breaks down so your plants won't have enough nitrogen to get what they need. If you have a snail or slug issue, I would stay away from mulching with things like straw or pine needles, um, mainly because they get in there and they can hide. I had a horrible time. I put straw down as mulch and our wet season is our winter. So in the winter, I put straw down as mulch and I had never had that much of a problem with snails and slugs. They were everywhere. The seventh mistake is not protecting your beds in the winter. Now, a lot of gardeners skip this step because it's fall, you're tired, you're burnt out from a long, hot summer, and you just wanna forget about it until spring. That's a big mistake. If you have cold, icy winters, you need to protect the soil. If you just have rainy winters, you need to protect from erosion. And there's lots of ways to do that. Mulching is one of them. A nice thick layer of mulch over the winter does wonders. I'll put a link below to a video I did a couple years ago on how to winterize beds, both in cold climate winters and mild climate winters. But you can also grow cover crops. Cover crops are just something, it's a blanket of green over your beds. The roots keep the soil intact. And as the plants die, if they, if they freeze, they will die. They will be taken into the soil like a green, um, green manure. So you're holding your soil in place and you're actually reinvigorating it with a cover crop. If you live in a cold climate, you might want to use something like winter rye that can handle the cold. Crimson clover is another one, hairy vetch. A lot of people think of these things as weeds and they can be. If your climate gets cold enough in the winter to just kill it, you don't have to worry about it. But if it doesn't and they remain and they start to go to flower, you can have a problem with weeds. But there's a real simple solution. Don't let them flower. As soon as you see the flower buds forming, just mow them down. Leave all those cuttings right there on the surface. They'll be taken into the soil to reinvigorate it. All right, that was seven raised bed mistakes. Now, if you wanna learn how to make the raised beds that I showed you, like I have in my garden, click this video right here for a simple step-by-step -step tutorial. I'll see you next time.